Does that play my audio? All right. Uh, so apparently, <laughs> I had I had no idea that the audio came through. So I've just been like saying shit. Hopefully, I didn't say anything too embarrassing while uh, while we were getting ready to go. Um, so let's see. Y'all should be able to see my screen and see my face and hear my voice. All those fun things. Hear me make drinking noises. Well, um, let's see. How many people do we have? Four. Okay. Oh, that's a pretty good turnout. Awesome. I don't know, um, is everybody on here a Columbia student or did some people just like find this through my YouTube? I'm just curious. I had intended for it to be just like a Columbia thing, but I'm totally happy to have folks uh, join in. Hopefully it'll just be, just be us. So... Welcome. I hope everyone has a beverage and a comfortable seat. Um, in the chat, you should share what you're drinking. Um, alcohol, not obligatory, of course. Mine is a, uh, it's a little bit of gin, a little bit of limoncello, a little bit of ginger syrup, and some soda. It's kind of an on-the-fly, last-minute concoction. Um, I wanted something and soda on top. It's not. This is not all pure alcohol. Um, so wanted something that I could, you know, keep drinking and, and not get not get too toasty, but we'll we'll see what happens. So this um this live stream is being put on as a kind of ancillary optional additional workshop as part of the architectural drawing and representation two course at Columbia that I'm co-teaching with a bunch of amazing folks. Um and there had been some requests for some, you know, kind of off hours workshops. We're all getting used to this, you know, this moment we're living in and figuring out how to, uh, how to, how to teach, how to share knowledge, how to work together, uh, when we can't physically meet. So, um, we, uh, are going to do a little a little drinking code today that will focus on working with images in Grasshopper, which is actually like one of my favorite things. Um, we don't often think of Grasshopper as a tool for doing image manipulation, and frankly, out of the box, it doesn't have uh, a whole lot of capacity for this. It has a few basic tools, um, but I'm going to show you a few additional tools that make working with images uh, more doable, more useful, including some new ones that I actually wrote just for the purposes of, uh, of this live stream. So um, if you plan to be following along at home, I would recommend going to the package manager. If you're on Rhino 6, you might have to type test package manager. Um, you'll also, you'll note that I'm on a Mac. We're going to see how this goes. Um, I haven't done a live stream on the Mac before, and, and sometimes we run into issues where, like, there's something you can do on Windows that you can't do on Mac. But these days, they're mostly the same, so hopefully we'll be able to get through it on here. I can switch over if I absolutely need to. Um, so the package manager command is in the, the Mac build of Rhino. It's in the, uh, the Rhino 7 work in progress build. And it's actually in Rhino 6 for Windows as well. It's just kind of hidden. You have to type test package manager instead of regular package manager. Uh, so for me, I'll just type package manager. Um, and if you don't already have it, or if you haven't updated in the last week, which you probably have not, um, to follow along with this, I grab the latest version of human, which should be 1.30, um, in which I have added a handful of new tools for working with images. Um, as we go along, I will be keeping an eye on the chat. Um, so please, please, please don't hesitate to interrupt me if you have a question or you want me to go back over something or you want me to share a file or whatever. Like this is this is super casual. Um, and you know, I have kind of like a loose set of things that I want to show, but I would be totally on board to like let the audience steer a little bit. So if we want to go more in depth into something or there's, you know, something we come up with on the fly that we want to explore, uh, especially, you know, privilege given to, to the, to the Columbia students who are watching, you know, I, I'm happy to help answer any specific questions that, that y'all have. 
So, let's go ahead and get started. Um, hopefully my slurping noises won't be too obnoxious as punctuation throughout. Um, the basic built-in functionality that Grasshopper has to deal with images is pretty limited. Um, there's a component called sample bitmap, I think it's called, uh, or sample image, image sampler, that's what it's called. And it looks like this, uh, and the way that it works, sometimes it's a little confusing to figure out like what it's intended to do. Um, but if you double click it, it will allow you to specify a file path. Um, and I have a set of like dummy images I'm gonna be using for this exercise. Um, and if you would like to follow along with these images as well, um, I'm going to drop a Dropbox link in the chat. So let's go ahead and go grab that Dropbox link. Uh, and I will put that in here. So um, the way that this works, oh, go away. Um, the... This is the sort of base interface for sampling an image. And by sampling, I mean to actually like pick a point on this image and then retrieve the color or the value of that thing. So the interface shows you a lot of information. For one, it indicates that the image has been given a two-dimensional domain. So you can see that the x-axis here is treated as being from zero to one, and the y-axis is being treated as zero to one at the top. Um, there are all kinds of tools here for like adjusting the domain, setting tiling. So if I sample a point like way off here, will it give me like the middle of the mountain or will it just give me the pixel at the edge and stuff? I almost never use any of that. I don't think it's super useful. Generally, when you're working with images, you basically just care about what happens inside. Um, and there's almost no reason to ever want to change the X and Y domain of the image. I tend to do my like value manipulation on the fly as numbers because it's easier to reason about rather than jumping into, you know, relying on some special feature of some obscure component. So there are a few other things. It will auto update if your image changes. I don't use that much. It also, it does serialize or save that image into your file. So even if you don't have access to the file path, uh, it will be kind of locked in the file. Some of the other tools we'll show today don't do that. Um, and then the one thing that I want to point out here that actually is pretty useful is the channel. So as you probably are aware, images are just big collections of pixels, each of which has an R, G, and B value. And we can have the image sampler output the color value as a color or a number value, which represents the red channel, the green channel, the blue channel, the alpha channel, which is like if you have a transparent background, how transparent it is, the hue, the saturation, and the value. Um, and the value is the one that actually is, I think, most useful other than just the color. Um, so uh, what that would mean, if I had white, I would be getting a value of one. And if I had black, I would be getting a value of zero. So, and anything in between is kind of proportionally located therein. So that can be really useful. So I've got my mountain and you can see because I turned on value, it's actually colored it black and white for me. I'm gonna go back to color just so we can play with this. So this component is gonna display a little preview of that image, but what are the inputs? How do we actually tell it what we wanna get? Well. This is all relative to that domain that we specified. So uh, the int that it wants is actually a point. And unlike a lot of components, because this is sort of a special component, it doesn't give you that hint. There's no like uh, preview when you hover over the input. So you kind of just have to know that the thing that expects, it, that the thing that it expects is a point. Um, and so we're gonna supply a point that lives in the two dimensional space between uh, zero, zero and one, one. So let's just try this real quick as kind of a basic exercise. Um, I'm going to construct a point with the construct point component, um, and I'm going to hook up some sliders to control the X and Y. You'll find that I use a lot of shortcuts when I'm creating stuff in Grasshopper. Um, if there's anything that I went too fast by or you didn't know what it was, just let me know. I also am going to use a plugin by my friend Mark Seep called Bifocals, which will put a little label over the top of all of the components that I place so you can see what they are. Um, 
So if I plug this point in, you can see that even though this point has a location in real world space, it's you know at 0 0.5, 0 0.5, it's being treated as sort of like an abstract point that I can use to sample this image. And the thing that's coming out the other side is the color. This is the R, G, and B value of that image at that point. And because mine is from 0, 0 to 1, 1, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 is right in the middle. So I would expect a color that's like somewhere in there. I don't know what that is, but we'll take a look. Another tool that's useful when you want to quickly visualize a color is the legend. Now, this is designed to allow you to like make a key where you have like colors mapped to some other value, but it's also useful as just a quick way to preview a color. If you plug in a single color and a single piece of text, it'll just show you what color you got. So as I drag this around, you'll see my point is going to move and it's going to update the color that it grabs. Um, oh, we're getting some echo. Um, let me see. Is it is it better if I do this? Because I I think there's like a default. There's a default mic, which was maybe on that, uh, and so maybe it's been on at the same time as my prime input capture. Is that better? Um, oh, we'll hope it's better. I there's like a. There's like a several second lag when I do this, so I have to like sit around and wait for you to actually like hear me say the thing and then answer. Okay, oh good. Okay, so that's good to know. I did not know that. That must have been the source of the echo issues in previous live streams as well. So we can sample this and we can get our color back. Um, but things start to get interesting when we, uh, when we sample an image at a lot of locations and when we start to play with the value. So the kind of classic grasshopper example that uses an image, which many of you are probably already familiar with, is to use the image sampler in value mode. So it'll spit back a, a decimal value between zero and one instead of a color. And instead of passing a single point, we're gonna create a grid of points. So let's construct this grid. Um, I'm just going to use the rectangular grid. Actually, let's construct a grid ourselves. I, I, we can use the like square or rectangular grid formats, but I always just like to build my own grids. So uh, I'm going to create a, a range that'll be my x coordinates, and another range that'll be my y coordinates, and I'm going to construct a point with that. And in our class, we haven't talked much about data trees. And I'm actually not going to avoid data trees this time. I think in prior in-class sessions, I have kind of steered away from talking too much about data trees, but I think it's actually useful to see them in action. And so I'm gonna try and use a few of the moments of today's session to kind of explain some of the concepts of data trees. I hopefully won't bore you with that stuff, but the kind of brief aside around data trees is that, as I think we probably know, when I've got a list over here, which is, you know, has indices from zero to 10 and has these values. And I have another list over here, which is the, basically the same. When a component accepts those two lists, it's going to try and match up the values at each index. It's going to create a point at zero, zero, which is zero in the X and zero in the Y. It's going to create a point at one, one, this one with this one, this one with this one, and so on. So the way we can sort of conceptually think about, I want you to do all of these y values for each of these x values is to graft the x list. Now, what does grafting mean? What grafting does is it puts every item in the list onto its own list. So we see that here. It has now, each of these darkened headings represents a single list. And you'll see that what was the index, like three, has now appended to this, which is sort of like a marker of this list. So when I go like this, the value at what was index three is now located at 003. And that's the name or the address or the path to this list. So when Grasshopper wants to pair up items, normally what it'll do is it'll match, it'll go through the index and it'll match. So it'll go zero, zero. And that is in fact still what it's saying, except because these are each on their own list, they're all at index zero. 
So what does Grasshopper do when it runs out of items? It just keeps using the rest of the list with the last item in the shorter list until it completes the, the pattern. So it's going to go, all right, first list on this side is zero. First item on this side is zero. It's going to do zero, zero. Then it's going to try and solve again for the next index. And it's going to run out of values in the X. So it's going to do 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.1, and so on and so forth. I won't dwell on this too much because I think a lot of you probably already know some aspect of this. Um, but uh, since a lot of my students probably haven't seen this in great detail, I'm going to try and explain the data tree stuff as it comes up. So what this has done, this was a great big aside, but what it's done is it's taken us from before graph where we had a diagonal line where it's 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, to a grid where we've basically created lists of points, one per, in fact, in this case, I think it'll be one per column. So we can now use those points to sample our image. The fact that I've set these up to already be in the range from zero to one is useful here um, because I know that they're going to live within the domain of this image sampler. And we can now use these values that have been sampled to, for instance, create circles at these locations. So let's create some circles. I'm going to use this darkness value as the radius, and I'm going to plug in the points that I created as the inputs. Now, that looks crazy. We're probably going to want to adjust these values. Um, and we also may want to spread out the points, but let's just start with the radii. Let's just make them smaller so we can actually see what's happening here. I'm just going to use a renumbers component to take these values from the domain where they already are, which is 0 to 1, to a new domain, which will be zero to some small value. Let's try this and see what we get. This is basically just multiplying it, but I like to remap because it's a little more powerful. You'll see why in a second. So, okay, uh, we've got some variation in our circles. In order to visualize them better, I think I'm also gonna pop a boundary surface component on here, um, which will just basically fill in a surface for each circle. I'm going to turn off the preview of my points because they're distracting. Um, and I might turn off the grid too. So we don't really see a mountain yet. Um, one thing we might want to do is increase the density of these circles. So let's bump it up to like 200, where by default it's at 10. Uh, and then let's do the same in the, uh, in the Y. So now we're going to have a ton of points. I like to do these slow operations so I have a chance to take a sip. In retrospect, though, probably should have done something slightly less than 200, but this shouldn't take that long. Famous last words, right? Um, let me see if I can cancel it out of this. Otherwise, we'll, this is off, we're off to a bad start already. I haven't even been drinking that much. But the principle here, the thing that I'm going to vamp now, the thing that is useful about this is that effectively we're able to turn an image into data. And we can use that data in any way we like. And it is a very good habit to get into in Grasshopper to uh, operate on the assumption that the range of your data, if you don't care about its specific values, if you just care about it as sort of like a ratio, um, to treat it within the domain from zero to one, you'll get nice predictable results. Okay, I, I way overdid that. I bet it's the um, I bet it's the boundary surface component that's mad because it's actually pretty slow. What I should have done is generated like a single boundary surface. Yeah, there we go. Uh, and before I do any more damage, I think what I'm going to do is lock the solver. This is a good habit to get into if you wind up in a situation where everything is responding really slow, and then quickly dial this back. So let's, probably 200 was a little over ambitious. Let's try 50 by 50. And I'm also going to disable the boundary surface because I suspect it was the, the weakest link or the slowest operation in that chain. There we go. That's better. So maybe we can remap this even smaller. Now we're starting to see some mountains. That looks pretty cool. Um, 
And it looks to me like the light parts are being rendered as, uh, as bigger circles and the dark parts are being rendered as smaller circles, which makes sense because we know, as I said before, black is zero and white is one. So the larger values here um, become smaller. So that's one of the reasons why I like to use remap instead of something else is that it's very easy to effectively invert the image. So remap takes some numbers from some range to some other range. We like the range where it is for the two, but if we flip the from to being from zero to one to one to zero, it basically has the effect of swapping that ratio. Now it actually looks even more like an image, especially if I zoom way out. Um, so uh, that's given me my little, uh, my little thing here. This probably will be fine. Yeah, there we go. And I'm gonna do, I, I always like to, when I'm rendering like a an image that I wanna just be matte shaded instead of the like, uh, like the shiny materials or the um, or the like default see-through red, I'll often use mesh colors as a way to just render it with like a, an opaque color. And I'm gonna use a trick that I think I've shown my students before, but if, uh, if you have MetaHopper installed, you can type col equals and then type the name of the color and it'll give you a swatch with that color preloaded. So there we go, that's looking more like an image. Um, so, uh, you know, we can control the overall ratio of this with this. If we were talking about like a real thing, like this is actually like, this is a process that I've used on real architecture projects. I feel like it's kind of a, like the perf screen with the variable size perfs is like a little bit of a cliche. Um, but it does come up and it is like there are lots of lots of more interesting variants on it but if you're thinking about a perf like this um you can uh you you probably don't want these extremely microscopic perfs you probably want to set a minimum size too so what i'm going to do is actually construct this domain again so instead of just passing in a slider which is a shortcut to the domain from zero to whatever number. I'm only gonna construct a domain with a start and an end, and I'm gonna use my two sliders to construct it. And so now they'll all be the same, but now what I can do is actually set an explicit size for the smallest dot I'll permit. Uh, and then that, that can be within some, you know, some minimal fabrication range. You know, this is the smallest bit on my CNC or whatever. So, so that's looking pretty good. But let's get um, let's get a little more fancy here. What I usually like to do is actually not use the image sampler at all. I tend to think it's like, you know, for one, it's it requires a user interface to make any meaningful changes to it. And I tend to like components in Grasshopper that are sort of already, that are as parametric as possible. Everything you can do with it, you can kill by changing the values that go in and out of it. So I'm gonna go ahead and save this to that same folder so that if you already have the link, uh, you, can, you can visit it. This is just like the simple image sampler. Um, I'm gonna show you what I often do when I'm working with images. Um, which also involves some new components in human that uh, that sort of encapsulate a workflow that I've gotten used to. And, and I've typically done it with just like homebrewed scripts, but now there are components that anyone can use. So the workflow that I like to use with images is to actually create them as a picture frame in Rhino. So I go grab my image file and I'll go grab, let's, let's make a puppy. And when you drag and drop an image, Rhino asks you what you want it to be. And you can choose picture. This used to be called picture frame. I think they changed it fairly recently. And you can draw it wherever you want. Um, so this is, um, this is nice, especially if it needs to be like located someplace in your model or you want it to relate to something or you want it some physical scale. It also avoids a problem that we had, even though I didn't mention it in the previous example, which is that like, we don't have any information about the aspect ratio of this image. If I had an image like 
this one that's pretty like horizontal, it's still going to wind up with a square aspect ratio because, you know, I have to somehow figure out or go look up the width of this image in order to make sure everything is proportional. So this technique allows you to avoid that. So the way that I do this, I take the surface, I reference it as a surface, actually. Picture frames are just surfaces that have a bitmap texture applied to them. And pardon me. It's the, it's, the, it's the soda in here. Then I use a new component um, from Human, which used to just be a script that I kept on my computer, called Picture Source. Picture Source takes a referenced Rhino surface and gives you back the bitmap, the path to the bitmap that it's textured with. So I can, you know, if I wanted to do a couple different images, you know, I can just reference a different one and it will figure out right away what uh, what that comes from. So then we can do something that, again, the sort of like image sampler workflow doesn't let you do, which is generate it based on a file path. So I create a bitmap from file, which also returns the width and height. So if you wanted, if you just had the file path, you could at least get back the information about the width and height of this image in pixels. Um, and use that to construct something with the proper aspect ratio. But because we've already brought it in as a surface, we don't even worry about that because we already know it's the right aspect ratio. And then the equivalent to what we were doing before where we were sampling the image is sample bitmap. So this lets you pass it a reference to a bitmap and then also pass it coordinates, which are in the domain from zero to one. There's no there's no futzing with the domain with this one. It's always from zero to one, and it's always the bounds of the image. Um, because I find that to be the, the most useful and the most common case anyway. And it will spit out both the color and the value. And it doesn't have any of the other sort of fancy filters or things like that, because I find that these are the, two, the only two things that I ever need. Um, but this being dynamic means that, you know, if I switch out the image or I drop in a new surface or whatever, I don't have to go double click on image sampler and go pull in any new information. So let's do something a little more advanced this time. Let's take our surface and let's contour it. So I'm going to use the contour command. I'm going to pass it the surface. I'm going to set some base point, which will be, I just type 000 to quickly get the origin. Um, some normal direction. This time I'm going to do 110 to create a little reference point. That'll be the direction of my contour. And then I'll put a slider in here for the, well, let's, let's make sure I'm not crazy as far as the distance. Let's do like, yeah, like two is probably good. So now we've got our contours. Ah, we'll want it tighter than that, but that's a good place to start. So what I want to do is basically like fatten these lines on the basis of the darkness of the underlying image. So this is more like the kinds of image workflows I often get involved with where I'm taking some geometry and I'm taking its relationship to some underlying image and then finding out the darkness at the point on the image. And then I'm using that to change the underlying geometry. There are lots of techniques that fall into this general bucket that have popped up over the years. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide this curve and I think let's just divide it for now. And then if we want to get a little more sophisticated later, we can. So I'm going to divide by 20. I'm going to get 20 points. And what I want to do is I want to take those points and I want to find their coordinates relative to the image. So these points are all in world space, and I don't even know like where they live. Uh, they could be anywhere. But what I really care about is like for this point on this image, like what is the like what percentage of the image width is that point? So there's a very useful, simple way to do this using surface closest point. And for this, we can take that surface pass it the points in world space and get back points in the surfaces UV coordinate space, which I believe are by default in the space from zero. No, they're not in the space from zero to one. So in order to do that, we'll have to reparameterize it, which you should always do anyway. So 
Now we've got our UV coordinates. So these are the coordinates in the surfaces domain. And we're gonna use that to sample the image. And just to make sure that everything is working, I'm gonna hide this and I'm gonna use custom preview on the points that I generated with these new colors. So let's just, I'm, I'm always checking things on sort of intermediate steps. Does that look like a puppy? It looks like a puppy to me. So this probably isn't a dense enough sample, but let's, uh, let's set it up with this first and then we'll, we'll go in and we'll tweak the parameters a little bit later. So I've got all these points and remember I said what I wanna do is like fatten this line. So basically what I wanna do, I'm gonna kind of demonstrate in Rhino. What I wanna do is have a line, a new curve that sort of follows the contours of this one, but gets like fatter where the image is darker and then gets skinnier where the image is lighter. And I wanna do that in a way that's mirrored over this line. So it'll be sort of like a, a fattening stroke or something like that. I did a bad job there, um, relative to the kind of underlying line. So how are we gonna do that? Um, so uh, what we're gonna do is we have, we have the colors, but what we really want are the values. And what we wanna do is take these points and, uh, oh, uh, Dan, it's a human thing, but I, I mentioned at the very beginning, it's brand new. You'll have to update human using the package manager. I released it on like Tuesday, I think. Um, so just go ahead. If you don't see these tools, just go ahead and update human to 1.3. Um, so uh, what I wanna do is move these points perpendicular to the axis that they're on. I don't know why. Yeah, there we go. Um, by, by an amount that's proportional to the value underneath them. And then I want to build a new curve that passes through all of these displaced points. So let's do that. So what we're gonna do is we have a few components of that to make that work. We know we have the value. We're probably gonna to wanna to remap that value to some range so we can control how far it goes. And we also need to know what direction we wanna move it in. So a lot of times I see people like rotate their tangent vectors. The way that I like to do this, to find a perpendicular to a curve at a given point, there you can also, I know like Quentin's really fond of using planes and then extracting the planes, which is also a totally valid way to go. The way that I like to do this involves a little bit of vector math, which I think is just useful to know about. Um, so I'm gonna take the cross product, which is a big and scary sounding thing of the tangent vector, which if we visualize this vector, well, let's just take a look at what this is. So the tangent vector just shows you what direction is the line at this point. And for these, because they're straight lines, it's basically boring. If you had a curve, you would have slightly more interesting things. Um, but what I want is a vector that is 90 degrees to that. And the cross product will calculate through a vector that is basically perpendicular to any other two vectors. So if you think about it in 3D, you've got a vector here and a vector here, which compose some infinite plane. The cross product of those two vectors will give you back a vector that points absolutely perpendicular to that plane. So it's a useful tool to have in hand. And it also does so in a, uh, in a consistent way. Um, so, you know, it will always point in the same direction. Whereas when I'm, you know, when I'm rotating, I don't necessarily know like what axis I'm rotating it about. It's a, it's a very useful tool to have in your arsenal. So with all that said, I'm going to take the tangent vector and the Z vector and take their cross product. And then I'm going to visualize that. And right away we should see, we're getting a bunch of perpendiculars to our line. And what I want to do is use that vector to move all of my points. Now, if I just move all of the points by that vector. And I'm gonna turn on this uh, simple thing, uh, this kind of preview only uh, selected thing. You'll see that they're kind of, they're all being pushed out a consistent amount. Um, but what I wanna do is for that vector to be uh, 
to be multiplied by the darkness of the underlying image. So we're going to use our remap values, which right now is not doing anything, but we're going to tweak it here in a moment. And we're going to multiply the resulting remap value to this vector. And now we should see that things are moving different in the mouth. Hard to visualize here will be much easier to visualize if we do an interpolate curve. So an interpolate curve will actually like pass curves through all of those points. And if we show our underlying puppy, you'll see that, remember a white is gonna be one, so that's gonna be the largest value coming out, and black is gonna be zero, so that's gonna be the smallest value coming out. And so now this is all being displaced. And in fact, because this image is pretty light, I would wager that most of these are moving like pretty far, in fact. Um, so we're going to want to do that. And then I'm just going to, just because I'm feeling lazy at the moment, I'm just going to copy and paste this and do a negative version of the same vector so that I get my mirrored image. So now each one of these represents a pair. Now, these are going really far, so probably want to dial back this distance using our remap function. So let's, um, let's set up a domain as well. I'm going to clear a little space. If you don't know about this trick, the option click and drag to clear space, uh, the, the Moses and the Red Sea feature of Grasshopper, that's a good one to know about. Um, so I'm going to construct a domain. And I am going to set this to be from some small value, like 0. I don't know, 1, 0, 0, 0. Uh, let's do 0. 0.2. And then I'll copy this. So now this is manipulating that range. First of all, we should see that relative to our original contour, now we're not going as far as we used to. So I can see for each one of these, I have the original contour, the one on this side, and the one on this side. And if I reduce the minimum and bump up the maximum, we can set it so that they like us touch. However, we can see that we're getting like thin where it's dark and thick where it's light. And most of this image is pretty light. Um, so we're going to use the same trick I showed last time. We're going to go zero to uh, one to zero as a means to basically invert the, the coordinate space of, or the, the kind of domain of, of these values. So now we should be seeing a kind of wide image separation. In fact, I think even this is like a little too wide. Um, and we'll be seeing a kind of thinner things where it's light, especially where it's white, it's very thin. And there are a lot of ways to, uh, to kind of join these. I think probably the simplest one is just going to be to loft them together. And this is a moment where I care about my data structure again. Um, if I just want to loft these curves together, I don't know whether it's going to loft all of them or when it's going to, whether it's going to make the proper pairing. So what I'm going to do is expressly merge them together using a merge component. And if I'm lucky, I'll get back lists of length two because that's what I want. I want to create a loft between these two, a loft between these two, a loft between these two, and so on, so that I get a kind of thickened value. Um, but it just so happens that it works out that way. You can see when I inspect this list, I've got a bunch of lists, each of which have only two items on them. So I can safely loft them. And let's hide this and see if we're getting anything better. That's starting, I mean, it, you kind of have to squint to see a puppy, but we'll fix that in a moment. So this has now successfully created those strokes based on the image. And one of the things that's happened, the reason why this puppy is not super happy at the moment is because we only sampled this with a constant amount. We could do a, we could just bump this number up, but I actually think what we want is for the number of divisions to be proportional to the length. So I want long curves to get a lot of sample points and short curves to only get a handful because they probably don't matter as much. So I'm gonna part the Red Sea again. There we go. And I am going to take these contours and measure their length, first of all. And then I'm going to figure out what I want the distance between each successive point to be. 
I think this distance looks about right. So let's just measure it in the Rhino viewport. That's about 0.3. We'll just start with that. And I'm going to take the length. I'm going to divide it by this value. And now that's going to be the number of divisions. You'll see what happens where before we have actually, I think, this kind of like cool diamond pattern. Now, if we divide them by differing amounts based on their uh, value, then we get a nice even thing. Um, someone suggested in the chat we can divide distance, which is a totally legitimate way to go. I tend to avoid divide distance because in fact, it's actually a more complex algorithm. It's a little bit slower because what it has to do is kind of progressively sample the curve point by point by point. This would have been fewer components. And in fact, it's you see actually, it took a fair bit longer to calculate. In fact, if I turn on my widgets, and turn on profiler, we'll see that that took 1.6 seconds, whereas this only took six milliseconds. So I tend not to use divide distance because divide distance has to sort of go along the entire curve and because it doesn't know what shape it is. And it has to basically say, okay, I'm gonna find a point that's at this distance. It's not as simple as just using the curve zone parameter space. So this works, it's fewer components, but it's a fair bit slower, so I tend to avoid it. There's also a utility component from Wombat, which does divide by approximate distance uh, or target length, I think is what we called it. And this one is just, basically, it's just these three things encapsulated into a component. It takes the length, divides, uh, divides the length by some target value, and then divides evenly by that. You can see that the results are in fact exactly the same. So if you have Wombat, you can use that, and it's much faster than the divide distance component. I get a little bit fussy about the run times of components because especially as you as you want to like make this bigger and bigger and I always want to like slide the slider to the right and make more and more and more of everything and so the the kind of runtime of individual components actually does wind up mattering. So now we've maybe got a little bit better puppy. I think we'll see this better. Everything looks better in black and white, I think. Uh, so we're going to use that same trick I showed before. We're going to use mesh colors and we're going to color it black, call equals black, and plug that in. There we go. I see a puppy. I don't know about you. Um, so, and the thing that's fun about this is that, you know, it's like super customizable, and there's nothing that says that, you know, these all have to be parallel, and we can... Let's um let's turn on preview of this. So now I'm going to turn off my preview only selected, and now I've got a bunch of junk that's visible. So usually what I do is I select the one thing I want to see and do Control-Shift-I or Command-Shift-I on a Mac to select everything else, right-click the canvas and preview off. So I just isolate the preview of the one thing that I care about so that I can now go over here and like play with maybe the distance of my samples. Oh, got too close. There we go. I think it, for some reason, it wasn't happy when we overlapped. Um, I can also, one of the nice things about a referenced point, a referenced coordinate rather than a point that lives in Rhino, is I can actually like drag it in the viewport and play with the angle of this and everything should still hold together. So we can pick the one that best captures our puppy's facial expression. Let's go maybe like this. Little, little, little puppy. All right, uh, that, that looks pretty good. Um, we could reduce the, the distance even further to that point at which it broke. Let's actually, let's do this just because, oh, maybe it was just still catching up. Uh, maybe it didn't break. I was gonna say we could go troubleshoot and figure out what, but it doesn't look like it actually broke. So I don't know, there's a puppy. I'm happy with that. So let's see what else we can do with uh with an image i think um one thing we can do is we can make a height field um i think a lot of folks like to use this command in fact i saw it in a lot of the process portfolio assignments where people will create a height field mesh based on an image so i want to show you how to do it in grasshopper so you have more control over it so actually, I guess that's not one of the automatic things, but you can type height field, which in fact creates a NURB surface, I think, rather than a mesh. Whereas theoretically, the thing that you would really want is a mesh. 
Uh, where are we? There it is. Let's pick Zaha. And I'm going to specify over here. I'm going to specify over here. And I'm going to say sample it with, again, this is like information. I don't know what the aspect ratio of this is. So I don't know how to make like evenly spaced points. Um, I'm going to guess it's like a 60 by a 30 with a height of 10. And oh, it, it will do meshes now. Well, that's nice. Um, and yeah, let's do mesh with vertices at sample. So now we've got like a mesh representation of this image and that looks pretty cool. And if you contour something like this with a little spacing like that, um, it's actually like not dissimilar to the, um, to the like th the find is on like a threshold in Photoshop, which is basically like if you think about when you use the um, it's not it's not threshold. What's it called? There's oh posterize. There's a filter in Photoshop called posterize, which is basically like will turn the regions of your fully colored image into like you know five steps of color. Um, and this is literally the same thing. We're basically like sampling the value and taking sort of like cuts at specific darkness values. Um, I mean, I, this, I, I don't know what this is good for, but, but we're gonna do something similar to this in Grasshopper and we'll have a lot more control over it. So there was a question from Raphael about going back and forth between Grasshopper and Photoshop. So I used to be really interested in this. Um, and in fact, a lot of my early work uh, is, is exactly this idea of kind of like like this this piece actually is in fact it's a grasshopper generated thing that i wound up post-processing in uh in photoshop in fact most of this stuff uh yeah this will be you know a post-process in photoshop um this is a post-process in photoshop um and a lot of these involve that kind of back and forth process um, but increasingly i have gotten attached to sort of like getting all of the graphics directly out of Grasshopper and Rhino, especially because my sort of primary production mechanism now is my Axidraw, uh, my little like uh, pen plotter, which you probably can't see over here. Um, maybe I can, I can show you. Let's see if I can set it up so you can see. Yeah, there's my, uh, it's a little hard to see, but I have a little like a pen plotter that I can put a little pen in and then I can use it to plot these. But in order to do that, I have to have pure vector geometry. So I haven't been doing as much with Photoshop lately um, because it's harder to get that vector geometry out. Um, it's certainly harder to have control over that vector geometry. So I also, I wrote a plugin called Shutterbug, which you can still download, which does like grasshopper control over Photoshop. But the, like, the way that you programmatically control Photoshop is really janky. Um, and it wound up being more of a pain than it was worth. Um, so, you know, I think you can still use it, but, uh, but I don't use it probably very much. I usually, if I am going to do also, uh, I, uh, when I, when I left WeWork, I lost my like corporate license to, to Photoshop. So I don't even have a copy of it anymore. So I can't even like play with it. Um, so, and and they, I can't, I, I have yet to buckle down and pay for a Creative Cloud subscription. So we're, we're going to see how long I can make it. So anyway, the, uh, the example I wanted to show, it's similar to, let's go ahead. I'm going to save this one too, just so we can refer back to it. This is, we're going to call this Puppy Stripes. And I'm going to use a lot of the same things. This little workflow here is actually going to be the basis of, uh, of what I do. Um, so, but let's just, that's only a handful of components. Let's start it from scratch. I'm going to drop in my Zaha as a picture. This is all review now. I'm going to take my surface parameter and reference it. I'm going to, uh, get the picture source from, with this new component from human. I'm going to get a bitmap from the file. You can see actually Shutterbug is where some of these components came from originally. Shutterbug also has bitmap from file and sample bitmap. And in fact, I just stole the code and ported it over to, to human. Um, but uh, a lot of the other Shutterbug components are not particularly 
useful anymore unless you have a, and in fact, this is like missing half of the components that I wrote. I don't really know what happened in any case. So file from bitmap, uh, or bitmap from file. See, I think the JIN must be working. Uh, bitmap from file, here we go. And this time we're going to create a, uh, we're going to create a mesh. We're gonna create a height field mesh and we're gonna control it ourselves. Um, so what we're going to do is we're gonna take this surface and we're going to turn it into a mesh. We're gonna use mesh surface, which lets us turn this. If I turn on the mesh view, now we can see the vertices. Um, yeah, actually, Raphael, I also have a plugin called Doodlebug, which lets you control Illustrator with Grasshopper, but it's also like kind of broken. Thanks, thanks, Adobe. Um, so what I want to do is I want I want my samples to be proportionate. I want roughly square samples. So I'm going to need to figure out how big my surface is. I could use the width and the height to do this, or I could use the surface dimensions. And this way, I can just specify. Uh, a like a fixed distance. Let's say I want my grid to be about that big. Okay, so that's 1.4. So I'm gonna say U is gonna be, which is the actual like approximate U dimension of the surface. And because we have a rectangular surface, it should be actually precise, not approximate. We'll make that the U, we'll make this the V. And now we've got our mesh. And we're gonna decon, so, I'm going to do this a little bit cheap way. You can also like, if you construct your UV coordinates yourself, it can be a little bit faster, um, but I'm just going to do it because uh, it's it's not that slow. If I deconstruct my mesh with the deconstruct mesh component, and then I'm going to just do the same thing I did before, which is do a surface closest point um, in order to find the UV coordinates. There are faster ways to do this, but this requires very few components and it's not that slow anyway. So I've got my UV coordinates. Now I should be able to sample that bitmap. Here's the bitmap by file. Here are the coordinates and here's the value. And now I can take that and I can remap it and I can turn it into some sort of a Z vector. And let's set our domain to be like, let's try five, I don't know. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna use, so because this came from my mesh vertices, I have 2,442 vertices. I should have 2,442 vectors, which I do, which means I can just move the vectors of the original mesh up by this amount. If we look at this in 3D, we should see that, oh, that's not right. What did I do wrong? Oh, I bet I didn't, uh, I didn't reparameterize my surface. Shame on me. There we go. So now dark parts are lower, light parts are higher. And we can now construct a new mesh uh, with construct mesh. This is a pattern you'll pick up on in Grasshopper as you get used to it is that anything you can deconstruct, you can reconstruct or construct usually. They're not always called those things, but that capacity is basically always available. So I talk a lot about like the hierarchy of geometry in Grasshopper, where getting really good at Grasshopper basically means being able to go from numbers to curves, to surfaces, to polysurfaces, to sets of polysurfaces, and back down to be able to like take these complex objects like polysurfaces and meshes and deconstruct them back into their lower and lower and lower level representations all the way until they're just numbers. And once they're numbers, they're just math. Like you can do whatever you want with them. Um, so that's like, I think that's just sort of a general philosophical point about using, using Grasshopper this way. So let's plug this guy in. These are my vectors. A mesh, if you haven't come across it, is a collection of these points and faces, which sort of span the points, but it's represented as a list of faces. And each face is actually just a pointer to the location in the list of that vertex. So what do I mean by that? When I look at these mesh faces, what am I seeing? I'm seeing a Q, which tells me it's a quadrilateral face. So it has four vertices instead of three. And it's a list of indices. So 
1147, et cetera. Those match exactly with the index values of this list of vertices. So in fact, when this tells me this face at 1081 starts at point 1111, that's not about its physical position. That's about its vertex position in this list. So if I go find index 1111, which I won't, I won't bother scrolling too precisely. Oh, there it is. Uh, it tells me that this face has a corner at this location. So a mesh is actually an efficient data structure because it doesn't require a bunch of extraneous information. It's basically just a list of vertices and faces. And then sometimes we add additional information like normals and other things and colors too. So let's, uh, let's take this and we can reconstruct a mesh with different vertices as long as they sort of follow the same general location and the same face topology. So if I turn this off, I have now constructed a new mesh with the old mesh's face topology. So it knows to go span because I've just applied a transformation to those vertices. So I can actually like, I can do this, it's allowed. So the next thing I think we're going to do, I hadn't actually like planned this one out too much. One thing we can do, actually, this is a nice good one. We can, um, we can also assign colors per vertex. And because we're already sampling the colors of the image at each one of those vertices, now we have a distorted version of this height field. We can go ahead and contour it. This same contour component operates on both meshes and, uh, and surfaces or poly surfaces or B-reps as they're called. Uh, I'm gonna set, I usually just set, uh, the origin of my contour is at zero, zero, zero. The normal is Z by default. And then I'm again, just take a look at this. Uh, I think, whoops, this, thank you. What did we get? 0.3 is a good distance. Whoops. I don't know why we're being so slow today. It probably doesn't like me live streaming at the same time as I'm doing all of this. So there's my uh, there's my contour. Now I want to show you a little trick that I think is pretty cool. Um, and the way that we're gonna do this, how are we gonna do this? So what I want is to make sure that at each one of these contours. I only have closed curves. So why, why would I care? I'll, I'll, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna leave this one for a little bit of a surprise because I think it's pretty cool. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my naked mesh boundary. Uh, so if I go get my mesh edges and the E1s ought to be the naked curves. There they are. And I'm just gonna go ahead and, and yes, the, the, there was a question, are these welded mesh faces? Basically, if the original mesh was welded, then so will this one be. And in fact, it was, so it is. Um, so I'm gonna take these edges and I'm going to extrude them down. See, this may seem like a super weird thing to do. We're going to do a negative, whoops, a negative Z. And we'll make it a magnitude of, it doesn't matter, like 40. Something, something big. Um, actually, we don't want it to be too big because that will affect my contour. So let's just see what we can get away with here. So as long as it, yeah, that looks good enough, I think. You know what we're gonna do? We're not gonna extrude. I think we're gonna pro uh, project. You probably think I'm crazy. What is he doing? We're gonna take these curves and we're going to project them. Actually, that's perfect, right? Because everything else should be above that world origin. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's exactly what we wanted. So I'm gonna take this. I'm gonna take the projected one. I'm gonna merge them together. And I think I'm actually going to loft it. Hopefully it'll let me get away with this. Oh, did I join them? No, I did not. So in fact, 
uh, let's just let's just join this curve. It'll be easier. Because what I'm trying to do is I want to I want to create sides of this mesh like this. So here's my like here's my distorted surface, and here's its sides. Because that means, and this is easier to see if maybe I make the extrusion a little more extreme. Right now we're only going up by five, but let's go up a little taller. Now, when I take a contour through all of this, and let's, actually, let's see if we can join all of these meshes together. I'm not totally sure this will work, by the way. This is like a variation on a technique that I have used to some success, but we'll see if it works. Let's check. So... Good check whenever you're merging multiple inputs into something is to make sure that they have the same tree structure because what I'm getting here, if I look at this list, is I've actually given it now two lists. Why is my, my mouse is not happy? I'm just trying to drag you. There we go. Okay. So in fact, it's given me two lists. So for now, I'm just going to flatten this, which will force all of these to go together. If I were being a little more disciplined, I'd go in and I'd actually like sh uh, move around these pads. But now we should have a single mesh. That's the other nice thing about meshes is that you can just join any old set of meshes anywhere in the world. They don't even have to be touching and you can join them into a single mesh, which can be really useful. So, okay, we've got our little extrusion. Now we're going to take those contours. And now what you'll see is that each one of these contours, this is useful like if to make a site model of this image, let's say, or, you know, I actually used to do this in architecture school. Maybe you like, maybe you paint the site model that you want and you feed it in here and then it becomes, you know, stacked chip or whatever. You can sort of like design the landscape you want to work with. So now at each of these layers, and I can see that contour is grouping the sets of curves by their layer, I should be able to do a boundary surface which will take into account any like holes. And I think I want to do one other thing because, okay, again, what the hell is Andrew doing? What, why does this matter? What I want is for there to be more layers where it's dark and fewer layers where it's light. So in fact, I think what I'm going to have to do is invert my, uh, invert this again when uh when i take these yeah so same trick basically right now it's creating uh, a high mesh where it's light but i want it to create a high mesh where it's dark so i'm going to do zero two one well one to zero rather and now this geometry should be taller where it was dark i've got a little image landscape here uh and fewer layers where it's light why do I want that? Well, if I were to do custom preview on this now, and let's just turn off all the other preview, control shift I to select everything else and preview off. And I'm gonna hide my surface as well. And we're gonna create a color black. Hopefully this will work well. Uh, and we're going to make that black pretty transparent. So what we wind up with is actually, if you look at it, a reasonable representation of the image. We've got some like visual contours and stuff, but where it was dark, we have dark. Where it's light, we only have a few layers that we're looking through. And the reason why I wanted to do all of this is that this is kind of the logic of cross hatching like when you're doing a cross hatch basically what you want to do is kind of like i want to find a good a good representation of this you kind of want to just layer on more directions the darker things get so in areas where you have light you have a few lines in one direction in the areas where you have dark you have a bunch of lines in a bunch of different directions so, and in fact, we really should do this with the mountain rather than Zaha, because I think it'll turn out better. Um, so let's just put it in here as a picture. Again, the beautiful thing about this is that like, I don't even have to change anything else. All I have to do is go reference this surface and all of a sudden we'll be, we'll be working with that. It's picking out the image and everything else. So 
and let's hide this. We also maybe want a little more detail, but let's leave it for now. Let's get everything working. Um, and then we're going to we're going to do this last step here. So does this look right? We've got light, we've got dark. That sort of matches our mountains image. Yeah, why not? Um, and so what we want to do is we want to contour our surfaces now as though we were sketching, as though we were like drawing across this thing. And we want to pick a different direction for each one of these surfaces such that we, we wind up with contours that are sort of overlapping each other um, so that where there are many layers, we get a sort of dense shading and where there are a few layers, we only get a little. So let's try it. Um, one of the other, well, let's, let's one thing at a time. Sorry, right. I keep getting ahead of myself. So what we're going to do, we know that for each of these layers, uh, we want to pick a different direction. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the list length of this, and this may seem crazy. I'm going to path shift it. So what do I get back? I'm going to get like counts of each of the lists, but I actually don't care about that. What I want is I'm just using list length as a component that gives me back one item for each one of these lists, because what I really care about is how many layers are there? There are 33 layers. So in fact, what I want is this list length. So I have 34 layers, which matches my like 34 branches, 00, 00 to 0, 033. And I'm going to uh, I'm going to turn this into a list of angles. So I'm going to create a range. And I'm going to put a slider on this. And I'm going to set it to some arbitrary value. We'll play around with it a little later. And we're going to, oftentimes, if you want to make sure you have the right number of values with a range, you have to make it x minus 1 instead of just x, because otherwise it'll give you one more value than you wanted. So because this is 34, now we get 34 values out. Otherwise, we would have gotten 35. Why is it like that? It makes sense, I promise. But don't, don't worry about it too much. So these are now going to be our angles. And what we're going to do is contour again in another direction taking all of these. I might also, just for simplicity's sake, I might mesh join these back again so they're not contouring like every single thing. It's just creating, as I mentioned before, your things don't even have to be touching in order to mesh join. Now I just have one mesh uh, for every layer and I'm going to contour that mesh and I'm going to contour it from 0, 0, 0, but I want the normal vector to be rotated by this amount. So I'm going to say, if I just contoured this by x, whoops, by the x-axis, what would we get? There's like a little bit of a lag on my keyboard today. I don't know what that's about. Or maybe it's, maybe it's brain lag with the, uh, with the cocktail going to my head. So, okay. I think the rough spacing should be something like that, 1.5. That looks good. This is not going to look like much. It's quite boring. If I look at it in 3D, it's maybe a little less boring. But what I want to do is uh, is rotate the x vector by this amount. So we're going to do rotate vector. We're going to take the x vector. We're going to rotate it by this angle about the z axis so that it sort of rotates in the x y plane. And Let's just make sure. So this is another moment where I have to make sure my data trees line up. I'm passing 34 branches. I want to make sure I also pass 34 branches of data here. So I have to graft this so that it goes from being a list of just 34 things to 34 lists of one thing a piece. So that's now going to be my grid direction. And let's, um, let's preview this with some nice thin lines, with custom preview line weights, color black. Uh, whoops, this is the, the color. And again, I'm going to do control shift, or uh, yeah, control shift I, preview off. And turn this guy back on. 
And now we've got some approximation of like a cross-hatched drawing of our mountain. Now, there are lots of tricks and techniques to get this to look even more natural. I think for one, like having the spacing not be quite so regular is definitely part of it. So you can like randomize that spacing. But this is like the basis of a lot of the cross-hatching techniques that I wind up using is like, let's generate some layers such that you have layers where it's dark and fewer layers where it's light, and then you contour it accordingly underneath. Um, and the reason I chose this arbitrary value is that I've found if you sort of like, if you have everything rotate too little, you get some funny results. Although, I mean, this is like something to play with in and of itself. Um, and I mean, that's actually, that's kind of cool. Um, but you can, you can play with how quickly they rotate. And it doesn't really matter if they rotate like back on themselves, if you go like too far once you get up to a certain layer. Um, and we can achieve like even more resolution here by simply bumping up like how we sample this. So we had it at 1.4. If I bump this to like one, this shouldn't be too slow, but we should see a little bit more crispness in the resolution of this like shading. So, I don't know if that made much of a difference, but it looks good. So this is a this is a technique. There are lots of variations on this technique. One thing that I want to show here to tweak this, I find this image overall a little dark. And you know, if I were to manipulate this, actually let's let's start uh let's start up GIMP, which for the record, I am not not a fan of the name of this application, but it's like an open source uh it's an open source image editor. It's sort of like a Photoshop competitor. When we are working with an image in something like Photoshop, let's just desaturate it to uh, to be able to look at it. Yeah, that looks. Oh, this is like doing some weird thing. I just want to desaturate. I'm not very good at at, at this application. Uh, desaturate. Yes. Okay. So what I want is to manipulate the kind of overall contrast of this. And one of the tools that's often used in these image editing software is curves. So what curves is, is a mapping from the values that you have to the values that you want. So if I want my dark values to be lighter, I just alter the curve so that dark value lighter. If I want my light values to be darker, I can drag them down. I can invert the whole image by making a curve that goes like this. And so what I want to do in order to basically adjust this such that I think I'm getting too much darkness, I really want maximum, I want like, I want like a lot of darkness where it's very dark, and then I want a lot more lightness. I just want like something closer to this. So I could just resave this image and load it in, but we can do the exact same thing in Grasshopper, and I often do. And it's a useful technique because this idea of kind of like manipulating the values according to a curve applies to stuff that has nothing to do with images. It applies to any zero to one data set or any sort of proportional data set you wanna work with. So how do we do that? So let's look back at this. I'm actually, I'm gonna save this out before I do something dumb. Um, this is our crosshatch example. And so what I wanna do, I wanna go all the way back to the moment where I got the values out of the image. We're gonna part the Red Sea. And I'm going to take all these values, which are somewhere in the range from zero to one, and I'm going to pass them through a graph mapper. This is the exact same thing as that curves dialog. So, and this is going to be a little slow, so I'll probably, I probably shouldn't set it to go, uh, go live. Um, but uh, when so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to, I'm going to temporarily disconnect this from its downstream stuff so I can manipulate it. Uh, come on. There we go. That's the uh, control shift drag, by the way, is how you can drag a wire around, um, including bundles of wires. That's a really good trick. Um, and of course, I'd let it go. There we go. Okay. So when I put on a Bezier curve, it is literally doing the same thing. It's taking whatever input values it has along the x-axis, mapping them up to the curve, and then projecting back 
whatever Y values they get. So what did I do over here? If I want darker darks and lighter medium to lights, then my curve should look like this. Just go like that. We'll get a little more in the darks and then we'll get a little more in the lights and we'll put it in. Um, it'll be a little difficult probably to see the exact difference. Um, but, uh, but I promise that what is happening here is exactly the same concept. That, that looks pretty good. I, I buy that. I think, I think that worked. So, uh, you know, this is, and we can, we can go investigate. It's this boundary surface that's going slow. I have another version of this that doesn't use this routine, um, that basically just like dispatches the mesh faces based on their underlying value to create the like filled in zones. And it's a little bit faster. Um, but the principle is exactly the same. So uh, you can do this with any data set in the domain from zero to one. Of course, you can double click and just like with the image sampler, you can like tweak the domain. There's no reason to do this. Just always keep your data between zero and one and then map it at the last moment to whatever values you actually want. Okay, uh, one more thing that I want to show. Also, by the way, in case it wasn't clear from the informal and slightly inebriated nature of this workshop, you are welcome to like leave at any time. You are not by any means obligated to hang out for the entire length of this thing. I'm just going to keep going until I like don't feel like it anymore. So uh, the next thing I want to show it actually doesn't have anything to do with image sampling. Um, but it's a lot of fun and it's a really interesting way to create kind of like unexpected or dynamic graphics in the Rhino viewport. So what I'm going to do, oh, let me, let me just save the latest version of that with the, uh, there we go. There we are and save. I'm going to, just in case it wasn't, uh, just in case people have joined late and the history isn't there or whatever, I'm just going to repaste the link into YouTube. But I think it, I think it preserves the history in any case. Um, so the other thing that human lets you do with images is use them as bitmap textures. So if I have some object like a sphere, I'm actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to close my other definitions in the hopes that that speeds this up a little bit. I don't know if that has anything to do with anything. So I'm going to create a sphere. And I'm going to say, we're going to do custom preview materials. This is another human component. And I, by default, it'll just render everything gray. And what I want to do is I'm going to show you another technique that I like. So I'm going to get the, the folder path of this folder. This is on, on Windows, you right click and while holding down shift and get copy path on Mac, you can tap option to get the path name. And so I'm going to paste the path of this and I'm going to use a couple other human components that I often do together in this, in this and similar workflows, which is I'm going to do directory contents, which will just list all of the files in this folder. Come on. I don't know what is going on here. It is, uh, it is not happy today. This is all I want. This is going to list all of those. It looks like all the images I want to work with are JPEGs. So this will also accept a filter. I can do star dot JPEG. Plug that in. It'll just give me back the JPEGs. And then I can use a component called the item selector to basically pick from this list uh, the item that I want. So if I want to map those mountains to this surface, I can do that. And all of a sudden, I have a custom preview. I, sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't, and I've never really looked into why it doesn't, but you can also use this as the opacity map for something else. So if I set the primary color to be like, uh, I don't know, white, no, that's a bad one. How about blue? Ah, and what we're seeing through is to this, that's why. So now it's actually like 
using that bitmap texture as the uh, as the transparency map for this image or for this this material. Um, and uh, some some images work better than others. I find I have better success with uh, with this. Oh, you know what? We should have done the still life with the crosshatch. Hold on, we, we got to do that one. Uh, I made this. I made this image, and I forgot about it, which is uh, just this. Um, I often I, when I'm doing like custom shading stuff, like like this stuff, I really like uh, the. I really like the effect that I get from just uh, an ambient occlusion render out of just straight out of the rendered viewport in Rhino. Um, so oftentimes I'll use those as my base images. And so that's also, that's like a part of this sort of like iterative computational process where I'm like using Grasshopper to generate a bunch of geometry in Rhino and then I'm capturing a screenshot of it and then I'm feeding that screenshot back into Grasshopper, sometimes even in the same definition. So let's go, let's just go see where we are so that I don't make it too big. And we're gonna drop in our still life. And let's just plug it in, see what we get. Oh, I should have made it bigger, I think, huh? Yeah, that's not very exciting, let's go bigger. Probably too big. Oh no. But yeah, look how cool that looks. You get, uh, because the shading itself is so clean to begin with, um, you get really nice results when, um, when you do this kind of like uh, ambient occlusion pass. This is also an example where I would probably want to adjust my, my curves, so to speak. Uh, just doing it default might be might be better in this case. Yeah, I mean that's like pretty dense, but I think I mean that's like that's like pretty legible. I think that's pretty cool. Anyway, sorry, getting distracted. Uh, so here is my sphere. Where are we? There we are. Zaha puppy. Boys, so all. Come on. Okay. So now we've got that. Um, so this is a this is a really powerful way to get a lot of like diversity and texture into something that you're building with Grasshopper. Um, and you have a lot of control over uh, over how it's mapped. So let us let us do this. I think what I want to do is I hadn't fully planned this one out. Um, I think what I want to do is take these. You know what we'll do? Yeah, let's let's do that. I think that's a fun example. Okay, we're gonna do a little bit of speed modeling. Um, let's create a plane and some walls like this. Ah. See, I'm, I'm actually like terrible at Rhino as it turns out. Don't tell anyone. And let's make another, let's make a ceiling like this. And let's turn on perspective and let's make a back wall like, like this. I don't know, whatever. Don't judge me. And let's put some stuff in here so that it's interesting. We've got a box. We've got, let's make a little column or something. And Let's make something in the foreground. Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, so what I wanna do is we're gonna actually use these bitmap tools to do something that they were not designed for. 
um, which is to produce uh, anamorphosis. So let me, let me make this go bigger. So if you're not familiar, there are all these artists, and I can never remember the name of like, there's an Italian guy, anamorphosis uh, art, um, who do these really interesting projects like this one, where from one privileged viewpoint, an image coalesces, uh, and from everywhere else, it just looks like nonsense. So like this, like you have to be standing at exactly the right point for these lines to align because it's actually existing on this column and on this back wall and stuff like that. We can actually use the bitmap tools in human to do this fairly easily because the principle of it is not that complex. So let's, um, let us take some sort of anamorphic projection on this view. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to maybe adjust my perspective view a little bit with the dolly zoom command. And I'm going to, I'm going to save my named view. So this is going to be like, uh, privileged view. This is the one. This is the spot where you have to stand in order to see this thing coalesce. And if I turn on the camera, we'll see he, this is actually like the location of that. And the principle of anamorphosis is pretty simple. It's like you have sort of like a virtual plane, which is your image plane. And if you just draw a line from your eye through that plane to any other point in the geometry um, and just draw the thing there, then it will appear flat from that viewpoint. So one other thing that I like to use when I'm doing this, because I don't know, maybe I'm in some, some funny angle or something. Eh, let's, let's stick with our privilege view. It's nice. Um, is I'm going to use the cplane command and set our cplane to the view. And then I'm going to go use my picture frame again. I'm going to make, let's put Zaha in this box. She would hate it. And I'm going to draw it as a picture frame. And I'm going to draw it literally like along the view exactly where I want it to be. And so I want this to be projected back on that. That's the goal. So uh, here's our privileged view, here's our surface. So what I wanna do is I need to take all this geometry. So we're gonna do all this stuff. That looks good. Here's my geometry. Oh, come on, there we go. And I'm going to need my, a reference to this surface, which is going to be my picture frame. And I'm going to do my, I think viewport properties from human will give me my camera location. And actually this might be, oh no, it looks like it's working. Viewport. So I want to use, this is another, another kind of pattern that's useful from human. If you have a list of stuff, and you want to filter the other stuff by the one value you picked in the list, like this. I've got a list of viewport names and a list of camera locations. Um, I can use uh, filter by item, where it asks for a guide list, which is all of the viewport names, the selected item, and then the camera locations with the stuff I want to filter by. And if you zoom in, you can add any additional list if you need to filter multiple things by this. But now this should be the point which is the privileged view. And let's just verify that that's true. Lo and behold, that's my point. It's right at the basis of the camera. So what I wanna do is now take all of this geometry, all of my 3D geometry. I'm gonna hide this surface now. And I want to mesh it, first of all. And uh, what I want to do 
is take all of the vertices of these meshes. Imagine that I'm drawing lines back. I'm not just imagining, I'm literally going to do it from each vertex to the camera. And now wherever those points intersect the picture plane, that is the point from which I'm going to get the texture information with which to render these things. And I may, just for simplicity, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to scale this up even further, uh, just so that we don't wind up with like a, like misses on our uh, on our intersections. So it might not be like the most beautiful, but uh, oh, that looks pretty bad, doesn't it? Should we do a puppy? What should we do? Um, also, I'm gonna move this to this layer and turn all this stuff off. I mean, that looks like crap. That's no good. Let's uh, let's let's just deal with it. We're gonna we're gonna undo everything I just did and. Uh, Leave it where it was. Yeah, that, that's fine. We'll, we'll survive. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the... Yeah, I know what we'll do. Okay. So we're going to take our picture plane. We're going to get the plane of that surface using surface center from uh, wombat or you could just do evaluate surface at 0 0.5 0 0.5 that would do the same thing we get our frame i'm going to get the plane line intersections or line plane intersections so i've got all of my little rays and this is going to give me the points even if they're well outside of the picture frame which in some cases they might be um i also i'm pretty sure i'm going to want to mesh this a little more densely so let's do custom mesh settings uh, mesh settings, and let's set a because we just want we want there to be more mesh vertices on here to work with, and let's set the max edge length to be like 0.5 ish. Okay. So now we've got a lot more points that are being sampled and just trust me, that will look better. Okay, so we've got a bunch of points. Now we wanna find those points relative to this surface. And so for this, I'm gonna use surface closest point. Again, as a way to basically map from world space to the surface space, and I'm going to reparameterize it so that I get my UV coordinates at 0 and 1. And, okay, whew, we're almost there. Uh, so what I want to do is take those UV coordinates. Oh, and of course, all my, all my crap is still on this layer. Uh, yeah, that's fine. So what I want to do is I want to tell the mapping for all of this geometry to use the UV coordinate that I just found, basically like its projection through the surface as its texture coordinate. So if we go over here, the rubber ducky lets you specify a custom mapping. So you can take any mesh, in this case, we've got a list of eight meshes. And I'm gonna graph this because I can see down here that I've already got like a list for each mesh. And I've got 2,362 total or, and 68 total vertices. And I've got the same number as of UV points. And now I'm basically assigning the UV coordinates to each one of the vertices of this mesh. And then if I use custom preview materials with this mesh, which now has UV coordinate information about its textures, embedded in each one of its vertices and I specify now we're going to need to get the picture source that it's using that as its bitmap boy it sure looks like the image we wanted right well that's only because we're standing in the privileged viewport or the privileged viewpoint we actually have created a perfect anamorphic projection of this image 
that's so perfect, you can't even tell how perfect it is until I orbit away a little bit. So this technique is a really kind of quick and fast way to play with anamorphic projection. Um, but I also think that just the general technique of being able to like put an image wherever you want it on your geometry based on custom UV coordinates is itself pretty powerful. Now, there are also, I should mention, some kind of built-in mapping components that don't require you to come up with the UV coordinates from each one. So you can map to a box, you can map to a cylinder, all the kind of common texture mapping operations are built in here. Um, but the custom one is sort of special with Grasshopper in that you can, for every single vertex, you can say, okay, I'm gonna go look up where I exist on this texture and, and that's what I'm gonna render on myself. Um, so I don't know, I think that's pretty cool. Um, I think that's probably enough kind of directed stuff for tonight. Um, but if there are questions or ideas of other things we can demonstrate or anything else, um, let me know. Uh, drop a question in the chat, drop an idea of something else I can straight. Um, I would love to hang around and, uh, and just kind of go with the flow um, of whatever anyone else is interested in looking at. So if you have a specific problem you want to solve or whatever. Thank you all for spending your, uh, your Friday happy hours with me. I can, I'm, I'm watching the video of myself over here and I can see that it's like still not catching up to the present, which is always like a mind fuck. Uh. Is it possible to map the original Rhino geometry? Okay, so this is a little bit of a complex answer. The, you, you cannot, the problem is that between like Rhino 5 and Rhino 6, they introduced like a new way of handling materials that's more powerful. Um, and uh, it, unfortunately, all of my tools were built, I think, at the time of Rhino 5, and they use the old style materials and the old style uh, UV coordinates. I am sure there's a way to do that programmatically. Like if you're comfortable with scripting, there are probably ways to apply that mapping to real Rhino objects. But now, currently, uh, with human at least, the only way is to literally bake this mesh. So the good news is that the, the geometry is, or the, the texture coordinates are preserved. So if I bake this and I go render it in V-Ray and assign it a material that has that same texture, it will have the, the kind of proper mapping. But this unfortunately has nothing to do with what you see when you go look at your texture mapping over in, the, in, in these palettes. Like this knows nothing about the kind of underlying mapping because I think it's sort of a simpler and older system. Um, so, uh, yeah, unfortunately, there's no uh, no no way to do that now. If there's a lot of interest, I can probably figure it out and extend human to support it. But I just have never really gotten around to understanding the kind of newer material and texture mapping systems in Rhino because I think they're like they belong technically to a plugin. It's a, it's complicated. Well, two in the morning. I I really don't think this is worth worth staying up that late for, but I, my bedtime's 1030. So I, I really can't, can't judge. I'll stick around for, for another minute or two. Um, but yeah, especially, um, for the, for the Columbia folks who joined, if, you know, if, if you feel like you'd like you'd like to take one of these ideas further or there's an idea of, you know, kind of something else you'd like to do, especially for these upcoming assignments, like feel free to ping me and I would love to sit down and maybe, maybe workshop some techniques with you.
The um, oh, okay, we'll do one more bonus because this is fun. I think. Let me see. Let me see if I can get it going. Uh, that recent image, the one that I showed here, uh, the I've been playing a lot with this kind of like scribble technique. Um, and unfortunately it belongs to a script that I'm, I'm not planning to share publicly, but the general technique is kind of fun, which is that I have it set up so that you can, uh, you can basically using the thing that I showed before, where we basically do like a, you're in a view, you take your geometry and you do a make to do from that view. And then you also in this saved view or whatever, you set your C plane so we can get like the render. Uh, so we'll go to rendered viewport. Uh, let's hide my curves for a second. And we'll do uh, view capture the file. Uh, and we'll save this out as a room or whatever. Then because my C plane is set to the view, I can go grab that same image, which is my room, and I can drop it in here as a picture. And for this, I might want to be in a wireframe viewport. And I'm just going to like roughly guess, like here and here. And we can actually like align this, especially if I turn on project. This is easier to do if you're in an, uh, a, orthogonal rather than a perspective viewport, but you can get this like perfectly aligned. And actually, if I wanted to move it back, what I would have to do is basically scale it about, uh, about the camera point. Let me turn off project. That should have the effect of like, hold on, uh, making it bigger. Yeah, like that. So I just made it very big, but it's still in the same position relative to my eye. Um, so you can do things like map from your 2D shading back to your 3D geometry, uh, and then use like the angle of the faces um, to uh, to kind of decide what angle to do your shading and stuff like that. And yeah, you you can definitely fetch the view rectangle. I actually think. I used to, uh, maybe, maybe it's not in, uh, oh yeah. Yeah. The viewport bounds, uh, is actually built into the viewport properties component. So we could, we could add it to our filter here and grab the, the rectangle that corresponds to that view dimension. Yeah. There are ways to even like everything I just talked about, all of the like alignments and the mapping the make 2D back to the 3D and stuff like that. You can actually get it to work entirely in Grasshopper. Well, I think we'll probably call it there. Um, Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is fun for me. I hope it was fun for you. Um, it's time for me to get a refill. Um, but enjoy, enjoy your Fridays, enjoy your weekends, and uh, stay tuned for, for more of these to come.